Welcome to Mayo Medical Laboratory's Hot Topics. These presentations provide short discussion of current topics and may be helpful to you in your practice. Today our topic is an update on the influenza virus, the need for preventative measures such as the flu vaccine, and available laboratory testing for detection of the virus. Our speaker for this program is Dr. Matt Binnaker, Director of the Clinical Virology Laboratory in the Division of Clinical Microbiology at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Dr. Binnaker, thank you for presenting with us today. Thanks for the introduction and thanks for joining me for this update on influenza. Before we begin, I want to mention that there are no financial or corporate conflicts of interest associated with this presentation that I need to disclose. Influenza is a broadly relevant and important topic, but we're also experiencing a transformation in the way healthcare is delivered in the United States. So as you view this presentation, I'd encourage you to consider several points regarding influenza testing. First, how is the testing going to be used in your practice? Second, when should the test be used? And finally, how will the results of these tests impact patient management? With that, let's get started. Influenza is one of the most significant viral pathogens worldwide. And before we discuss the clinical impact this virus has, let's first review some background information. Influenza is an orthomyxovirus that has a single-stranded RNA genome. It is an envelope virus, meaning that the outside layer of the virus is composed of lipids and proteins that are derived from the host cell. There are three main types of influenza virus. Influenza A, which is the type that we're most familiar with and causes the most clinically significant disease. Influenza B, which is also a human pathogen, but typically causes less severe disease. And finally, influenza C, which is a much less common cause of disease in humans. These viruses can infect both birds and mammals, and in temperate regions tend to be associated with a seasonal pattern of disease outbreaks. As you can see in this figure from the Centers for Disease Control, influenza A activity typically peaks in December or January each year in the United States and returns to baseline levels by early spring. In terms of transmission, influenza viruses are spread through respiratory droplets, for example, through sneezing or coughing. Alternatively, influenza can also be spread by coming in contact with contaminated objects, such as touching a contaminated door handle or tissue and then touching your eyes, nose, or mouth. As I mentioned earlier in the presentation, influenza is one of the most significant viral pathogens worldwide, with the World Health Organization estimating that influenza A infects tens of millions of individuals annually and causes between 250,000 and 500,000 deaths per year around the globe. Importantly, this is not just a disease that affects developing nations. In the United States, the CDC estimates that influenza contributes to about 30,000 deaths per year. When an individual is infected with influenza, they may begin to have symptoms in as little as one to two days after being exposed. Typically, influenza presents with an abrupt onset of fever, headache, and a dry cough. Patients may then develop a high fever and body aches that are often severe. In some patients, especially young children, influenza may be associated with nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea, but this is not a common clinical presentation. Complications of the disease may include a secondary bacterial pneumonia, and in rare instances, infection of the heart or the central nervous system. It's important to know the difference between influenza, the common cold, and GI or stomach ailments that may be caused by other viruses. The routine cold and common stomach illnesses are not caused by influenza virus. So take special care when using the phrase, I've got the flu, as this can lead to misperception of influenza in the general public and may influence others' decisions regarding whether they choose to receive the influenza vaccine or not. That leads us into an important question that I often hear, which is why do I need to receive the influenza vaccine each year? A primary reason is that influenza is an RNA virus, which means that its genome is made up of RNA rather than DNA. Because of this, it uses a protein called an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase 
to make new viral proteins, and this RNA polymerase lacks proofreading ability. In other words, it doesn't check for mistakes that it might make, and therefore produces about one error in every 10,000 nucleotides that it transcribes. This inherent error rate leads to a phenomenon known as antigenic drift, which is the result of point mutations that cause small changes in viral proteins or antigens. These minor changes to the virus are the reason why prior infection or vaccination does not yield long-term protection. Another important issue related to influenza is the possibility of global pandemics due to this virus where millions of people can be infected around the globe and the infections may be associated with severe morbidity and mortality. So what causes these influenza pandemics? Well, unlike antigenic drift, which is the result of minor mutations in the viral RNA genome, pandemics are the result of antigenic shift, which is the sudden introduction of a completely new serotype of virus. This is usually due to genetic reassortment rather than specific mutations. The genome of influenza is composed of nuclear material that is in eight distinct segments, which allow for these segments to be potentially mixed and reassorted, leading to the emergence of new proteins that are expressed on the surface of the virus. To help further illustrate antigenic shift, let's review the figure on this slide. Let's say, for example, that an individual happens to be infected with a human influenza virus and an avian influenza virus at the same time. This might occur if the individual is visiting a large poultry market where both birds and humans are in close proximity. Fortunately, a co-infection with two different influenza viruses is believed to be a rare event. But if this would occur and both viruses happen to infect the same cell, there is the possibility that the segmented RNA genomes of both viruses might mix leading to the generation of completely new viral proteins and a novel virus that has characteristics of both the avian and human virus. This hybrid virus may be one that humans have not been exposed to previously and therefore would not have any pre-existing immunity to. Now let's turn our discussion to the laboratory diagnosis of influenza. It's important to point out the viral shedding may begin even before an individual develops symptoms, but the amount of virus that's being shed is maximal in the first two to three days after symptom onset. When a patient presents with suspected influenza, the recommended specimens to collect include a nasopharyngeal swab, which is typically considered the gold standard sample type for detection of influenza. Alternatively, a nasal swab or throat swab can be collected for influenza testing. And if a patient is suffering from lower respiratory illness that may be due to influenza, a sample type such as bronchoalveolar lavage fluid can be collected and tested. Historically, samples collected from patients with possible influenza infection have been submitted for routine viral culture which is a sensitive approach, but may take two to five days to become positive. Viral culture requires laboratory technologists to perform certain tests, including heme adsorption or hemagglutination, which help to support the identification of the virus as influenza. Recently, molecular detection of influenza virus, for example, using real-time PCR, has become the recommended approach for the rapid diagnosis of influenza. This approach yields excellent sensitivity and specificity and typically allows for results to be reported within hours of the laboratory receiving the specimen for testing. Molecular testing can be performed off a variety of sample types, including NP swabs, throat or nasal swabs, NP aspirates, bronchial washings, or BAL fluid. At this point in the presentation, you may be wondering about the use of rapid antigen tests for the diagnosis of influenza. These assays, which detect influenza antigens from clinical samples, have been used for many years, and the advantages of these tests are that they provide results in less than 30 minutes, and they are often CLIA-waved and therefore can be used as point-of-care tests. In essence, patients can receive their results before they leave the doctor's office. 
However, rapid antigen tests have been shown to suffer from low sensitivity, so a negative result by one of these assays cannot be used to rule out influenza. Samples testing negative by our rapid test need to be reflexed to viral culture or PCR for a definitive answer. These limitations have prevented rapid antigen tests from being broadly implemented for the routine diagnosis of influenza, but there have been some recent advances in rapid diagnostics that I'd like to discuss on the next slide. Recently, several molecular tests have gained clearance from the FDA for detection of influenza A and B directly from NP swabs in less than 20 minutes. Studies evaluating the performance of these new tests have shown that their sensitivity is comparable to standard real-time PCR assays and far superior to rapid antigen tests. The first test is called the Allere I assay, which targets both influenza A and B. The results of this test are available in about 15 minutes, and importantly, the Allere assay is CLIA-waived, meaning that it can be used at the point of care. The second assay is the cobos liat influenza A and B test, which is also CLIA-waived and uses real-time PCR to generate results in approximately 20 minutes. These rapid molecular tests may offer a promising new tool to quickly diagnose influenza in primary care and emergency department settings. In terms of prevention and treatment of influenza, the emphasis should always be on prevention as the primary defense. Patients and healthcare workers should be diligent about washing hands and avoid touching their eyes, nose, and mouth with unwashed hands, especially after being around sick contacts. And the most important method of prevention is to get the annual influenza vaccination. We discussed earlier why an annual vaccine is required and even when the effectiveness of the vaccine in preventing illness may be lower than hoped for, there is evidence that the vaccine may help reduce the severity of disease in patients that do develop symptoms. There are several antiviral drugs available that can be used to treat influenza, but these should be considered a second-line defense, and they are typically not recommended in otherwise healthy individuals. Treatment with antiviral drugs is usually reserved for patients that are very young, elderly or critically ill, and for optimal results they should be given within the first 48 hours of getting sick. In summary, influenza is a significant cause of disease worldwide, resulting in hundreds of thousands of deaths each year. Antigenic drift results from point mutations in the viral genome that give rise to slightly different viruses. This is the primary reason why we have to receive the annual influenza vaccination. In contrast, Antigenic shift results from genetic reassortment that yields completely new proteins and novel subtypes that are capable of causing global pandemics. And finally, when laboratory testing is required, it can be best accomplished by detection of influenza virus using real-time PCR. Thanks again for joining me for this update on influenza.